you know, people say, oh, I'm no good at music. I can't yeah. sing. Um, so probably music or music therapy wouldn't be beneficial for me. How would you answer that? I'm so glad that you're asking this question, probably the most important question to ask. This is what people in our studies, particularly the Parkinsonic singing study, were coming up to us during screening and during the um, study itself and saying, I was discouraged from a young age by my parents, by teachers, by others saying, you know what, you have no talent, you have no place singing or playing a musical instrument. That cannot be farther from the truth. There is, I hope I've helped convince you after my brief talk today, something to be gained for everyone regardless of musical ability um, when it comes to music and rhythm exposure. So uh, yes, it's true that from a genetic standpoint, from an exposure uh, standpoint, everybody's starting at a different uh, point in yeah. terms of where you are, but there's no question, and this has been clearly shown, that music and rhythm-based interventions can help people across the full range of musical ability. When it comes to true uh, tone deafness, it's called amusia, actually. It's actually very, very rare, less than 1% of the population. So uh, we're talking about 99 plus percent of us who are able to process melody to at least some extent and can glean things. And even for those with amusia, they could still process rhythm. So something like dance for PD or beating to a drum can still be therapeutic for those folks. So please do not be discouraged. And uh, what I'm saying is it's never too late, regardless of age to start activating parts of the brain that have been dormant and start leading to neuroplasticity and hopefully creating new pathways to get around pathways that have been uh, damaged, that are in the process of being damaged by aging, Parkinson's disease or other diseases. You uh, mentioned uh, music therapy. Can you describe briefly, what does a music therapy session look like? Yes, highly individualized and something that I didn't realize myself until I worked, started working closely some years ago with some uh, talented music therapists. There, uh, so training is still um, a bit variable depending on where it's done. The big difference is between North America and Europe, for example. But certainly, if you think of a psychotherapist, a talk therapist, let's say, who uses cognitive behavioral therapy techniques, probably familiar to most people listening, that is an aspect of what a music therapist can do. And that's very important for so many people, isn't it? However, they, off, they incorporate it and use it through music. Whether it's therapeutic instrumental music performance, pattern sensory enhancement, rhythmic auditory stimulation, music assisted relaxation, and many, many other examples of music therapy that a music therapist could show you. These are all things that could be incorporated and are highly adaptable and individualized to a particular patient. So this is what I've seen in my experience referring to uh, music therapy. And by the way, I want to um, add that during the pandemic, of course, as so many other things, uh, music therapy has shifted largely to virtual mm -hmm. interventions. And we are very interested in doing studies of this. And I think it has, uh, there's a lot of potential of uh, using uh, music therapy virtually, which is why we have these virtual classes. And is music therapy covered by insurance? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, now we're asking about a question that really gets into social prescribing. You need to look state by state. Um, in May of this year, I'm happy to say that Maryland became the 11th state to approve a licensing board structure for music therapy. That is a crucial step on the pathway towards unique code creation for Medicare and other health insurances to be able to bill. As of now, what music therapists in most states do, typically working in a hospital setting, is an occupational physical therapist does an initial evaluation. There's a determination that a music therapist uh, can help, and they piggyback on the same codes that occupational physical therapists use for follow-up visits, which is obviously inefficient and doesn't always get covered. So the answer is it's very different state by state, and uh, you know certainly you might guess East Coast, New York, Massachusetts, other New England states are the ones that have led the way here. But uh, my goal uh, in my lifetime is to hopefully have all 50 states get the licensing and that this is national and that there's a universal reimbursement for it. Because frankly, to something that has uh, arguably little, uh, if any, side effects and has a lot of upside, including not only quality of life, but actually changing the um, rate of disease for certain diseases, 
I think there's a lot of upside from a health economics standpoint. And in the U.S., we need to make the health economics argument to get the bean counters to get this covered. And that's, that's what we're working on in the coming decades. Yeah. Does, does music help with apathy or depression? That was a topic we just talked about before you came on. Was yeah, wonderful. A wonderful segue. So if I'm going by the studies, uh, a couple of which I summarized for you today, it seems like mood is what improves across the board and quality of life is what seems to improve across the board. Apathy specifically, it's interesting. So we know that music activates those areas of the brain that um, are affected in diseases like Parkinson's disease, which leads to apathy. So you definitely are getting that activation from repeated music exposure, paying attention, and then assuming it's enjoyable music, again, that's the caveat. Mm -hmm. You gotta find what you enjoy through a playlist, for example, then you're gonna be motivated. Chances are you're gonna be motivated to come back to it and exercise to music or play an instrument, do, do things time and time again. That's the motivational aspect. And in fact, I think that's a key part of the value that music-based interventions add on top of something like standard LSVT big therapy or loud therapy which uh, can be very effective, but people lose motivation to do over time. Yeah. Yeah. Are there many uh, physicians like you who understand the benefit of music or are you unusual in your understanding of those two fields? That's a little bit difficult for me to answer, certainly in terms of throwing statistics out. Yeah. I could say that our center I think is unique in the United States for its breadth, uh, arguably, USC and UCSF, California, San Francisco, have uh, you know centers of similar scope. Uh, but um, certainly things, let me put it to you this way, things have moved in a good direction. So the fact that I just gave the example of a licensing board approved for music therapy in the state of Maryland just in May of this year during a pandemic, I think speaks a lot to the fact that people are generally paying more attention to the potential benefits of music. The other really encouraging thing which drives things is the fact that the NIH is putting real money behind this kind of research. $20 million in 2019, and we still have to get the final budget, but hopefully at least another 20 million for projects that will move music and health research forward in this fiscal year. So these are key things that indicate there's forward movement in recognition of importance of what music and rhythm can do for health. That's really exciting. Super Thank you. A couple more questions, uh, if you have a few more minutes. Absolutely. Uh, do you have advice for people uh, here who are listening as to how to find a, a Parkinson's choir or singing group, or does it have to be Parkinson's specific? How, how do you encourage people to get involved in their community singing? Fantastic practical question. So I think the first uh, thing, as always, to pretty much any question is Google. Uh, beyond that, um, if you have, it depends on disease stage also, if um, this is kind of like rock steady boxing classes with different, with different degrees of difficulty, if you're early on in the disease course, you're not a couch potato and you've been an avid exerciser, exerciser your whole life, especially if you've had prior boxing exposure, then I wouldn't recommend a class for PD, I would recommend a regular class so that you really push yourself to keep up with those without Parkinson's disease. And yes, I have patients just like that with PD who are keeping up. Now, same thing can be said for joining a serious, uh, or rather a choir of people without PD. Um, other than that, uh, in the Dallas area, for example, there's an amazing choir. Um, it's called the Parkinson's Voice Project. I don't have it on the slide, but the Parkinson's Voice Project have a lot of funding at this point. They couple their singing with LSVT, which is just fantastic. And they've been spreading Iowa, um, in rural Iowa, I believe in Iowa State University, there's a growing number of choirs that uh, Elizabeth Stegemoller, yep. who is a, uh, a great partner of mine and a colleague, who yes. has been uh, moving forward. Obviously the Baltimore choirs in Philadelphia, there's a choir that I started before leaving uh, to Baltimore, still going strong. So you want to Google, uh, look around carefully, and uh, seek and you shall find. One of the singing groups we know of here in our local community is called Tremble Clefs. Oh, I love that. And uh, I've, heard, I've seen those in different communities as well. So that may be something people could, could Google that, Tremble Clef. One last question, and then I'm going to close with a, uh, a couple of comments we've heard. 
uh, to your session. Actually, two questions. Is there a difference uh, between listening to ambient music or using earbuds and or headphones? Any any difference in efficacy? Fantastic question. Um, the short answer right now is no. In terms of what's used in studies, typically it's through headphones because if there's other ambient noise that's superimposed on top of what you're listening, uh, if you don't have headphones, uh, then you know it's being mixed up. So it's hard to tell the uh, effects of intervention, whether it's music or something else. So we use headphones typically or earbuds, but certainly for just uh, you know d do it yourself at home. If you prefer to not have something in, in and around your ears, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Oh, great. Somebody asks, uh, do I have to give up guitar? I'm, I have trouble keeping rhythm at this point. Wow. So this is very tricky. And in my experience, this is where prior level of expertise plays into it a lot because there's a lot of uh, frustration that goes into somebody who is professional or a serious musical performer on an instrument. And then losing that ability is very stressful and frustrating. So at that point, I would say let it go. For everybody else who doesn't have that level of uh, you know, hours of practice, 10,000 hours for expertise commitment, I would encourage you as much as possible to never let it go. Keep plugging at it. I just showed you results from our Guitar PD study. Obviously, they're not a slam dunk, and more studies need to be done, but that's true for most things, <laughs> for, for behavioral interventions, surely. Uh, but clearly, we had directional results even for things like typing. There was some accuracy improvement. So it seems like there may be some carryover effects. Certainly, mood and anxiety are likely to improve if you are doing this on a regular basis, at least twice a week. So I would urge you not to give it up. Right. Many of our community doesn't, don't really understand how to develop a set list and what that looks like. Playlist? Yeah, playlist. Is that something people can just put on a, an old record or a cassette tape or and listen to music, right? Well, certainly, yes. It's all about what's personally preferred and selected. I was giving examples from applications. They happen to be free. Um, you know, spot, there are paid versions too, but you could build a Spotify playlist very easily. You could build a Pandora playlist. I use this with my kids all yeah. the time, and they're just crazy about these things that run and repeat <laughs> all so, the time. So ask your kids to help build you a playlist if you don't know how to do it. What a wonderful way to pick up on what I was implying, yes. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, we really appreciate the work you're doing and, and spending time with us today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a good day.